Welcome to Amsterdam and KubeCon Cloud Native Con 2023. Join John Furrier, Savannah Peterson, Rob Streche, and Yu Pizka as the Cube covers the largest conference on Kubernetes, cloud native, and open source technologies together with developers, engineers, and IT leaders from around the globe. Live coverage of KubeCon Cloud Native Con 2023 is made possible by the support of Red Hat, the CNCF, and its ecosystem partners. Good morning, favorite nerd crowd, and welcome back to Amsterdam. We are at KubeCon Cloud Native Con EU, and I am joined by my fabulous co-host and analyst. I've got Rob on my right, I've got John on my left, I'm Savannah Peterson, and this morning we have a very special guest who's going to bring a lot of insights. He's a contributor and a total baller. Jason Bloomberg, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Very good, thank you very much. Awesome. I am I'm so excited that you're here. You've been spending a lot of time, you know, we we love sitting here on set, but we don't get to interface with right. people who aren't guests very often. So I'm really excited. You mentioned you've been spending a lot of time in the startup zone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's hot? Well, it's great to see that there's greater focus on day two, that is full production operations. Uh, one of the challenges of Kubernetes is it takes a lot of ramping up, you know, planning, that's day zero, ramping up is day one. But day two is where the rubber hits the road, right? Companies who are in full production have multiple clusters distributed globally uh, and thus require infrastructure that can support that in production at, uh, in a live environment. And there's an increasing focus on that both from the vendors as well as the, the attendees here. So uh, we've been talking a lot about kind of the tipping point and, mm -hmm. and the momentum. It feels very different at this KubeCon. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like the ecosystem has matured to that next level? Well, I think what's really different about the feeling here is that almost 60% of the people are first timers at KubeCon. And so as a result, they, that 60%, they're not the vendors who always come to these shows, right? They are the enterprise end users who uh, are either infrastructure people or increasingly the application people, application developers. And that is a new audience for KubeCon, right? For the most part, it's been all, all about infrastructure. So you have the infrastructure vendors and the infrastructure engineers uh, talking about infrastructure. But the whole point of the infrastructure is building and running applications. So uh, you can't really get to that until we have that application-centric audience. And that's, this is the first KubeCon I've been to that has really a critical mass of application people at it. Jason, I want to get your thoughts on the, uh, your discoveries and conversations around what their people are talking about, because obviously you get, it's that tale of two KubeCons right now. We uh -huh. were talking about this on our first day and second day. The submissions for speakers were in November, uh -huh. and ChatGPT took the world by storm in January, right. February. So a lot of AI conversations in the hallways, but not so much on the tracks. What's some of the conversations you're seeing around the, the companies, around what they're focused on? Because this is like an infrastructure crowd, obviously the practitioner side, day two means more operationalizing it. But AI is now in there. I was just talking to Sajeev, who was on earlier, about a former Gartner analyst, about data. This is not a data-centric crowd. Is there right. a lot of data conversations? What are you hearing? What's some of the AI buzz, if any, or is it, was it, was well, it I, muted? I actually think what's remarkable is that there isn't a lot of AI buzz. You would sort of expect generative AI to be the hot story, but that's not really what's going on here at KubeCon. If anything, there's less talk about AI or generative AI in particular than you might think. I've talked to a few vendors who rushed some sort of generative AI thing into production, but for the most part, uh, <laughs> this is a very, yeah. uh, I guess, very down-to-earth realistic crowd. And this is something that's been true of KubeCon all along, is that uh, yeah. these people are focused on technology that actually works, that, is, that can run today, that actually meets uh, customer needs today, as opposed to a lot of sort of marketing uh, hand-waving. So well, even I though, mean, I mean yeah. ChatGPT isn't, I wouldn't say hand waving, but well, there, is, there, is a, there is a, well, I mean the prompt, <laughs> it, does, it, it is pretty cool, but it does have hallucinations, Savannah. Right. So, so these are infrastructure people, Rob, we were talking about security, <laughs> I mean, yeah. you can't have a gap like, oops, well, <laughs> I, well, I, think opened up. I, I think what's been interesting is, and I, I think over multiple guests and people, and the few times I've been off the set to talk to people, it's been, security is really still an open issue. Mm -hmm. And I, I think to your point about day two, especially yeah. how do you productionalize apps in a secure way? And that's been a, another theme that I've seen outside of uh, some of the big guys who've been here a lot, but even they are talking about, everybody has their security bent to what they're doing as well. Are you seeing that with the others and the startups and? Well, absolutely, but 
But that's nothing new, right? Security yeah. has always been a top priority yeah. and is part of every conversation to some extent. So, that, so that's important and it continues to be important, but it's not something yeah. that's really new, that's a, yeah. a change from previous well, years. Well, I wanted to bring up the AI thing, mainly because I want to get your reaction to what you're hearing, because uh -huh. I agree with you. We've, we, actually, we've been talking a lot about AI, only as a frame, we're trying to understand where it will land, how it will meander around, where it will, what it will be focused on, but to your point about day two operations, this is, this is not just testing and, and dev, it's like right. full ops. Mm -hmm. So there's no tolerance for BS and, 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 and whatnot, right? Well, yeah, exactly. So, uh, and, it, and it's one of the reasons why I like coming to KubeCon is that it's a, it's a very low BS show. Right, uh, you, you're, you're not going to run. Low code, it. low BS. Well, you're not going to run. Like, it's, there's never been talk of blockchain here, which I love. Yeah, right. Yeah. Oh, if bless. There's, if there's ever blockchain at a show, it's like, okay, that's a BS show. <laughs> so this is nice to have a, a, a no BS show. And, and I think with generative AI, obviously, <laughs> you got a little bit BS on the cube. Okay, but yeah, that's generative awesome. AI obviously ha has very impressive capabilities, but it also has sort of that dark side, right? The hallucination. Yeah, yeah. 100% uh, agree with or, you. Or and and we're just figuring out some of yeah. its negative implications. So. Yes, uh, you could very well apply it to, uh, you know, I don't know, day two operations. You know, how can you configure a very broad, complex set of uh, uh, technologies and you might leverage AI yeah. to, to optimize that. Yeah. But the last thing you want is for AI to go off in the wrong direction, yeah. right, and recommend something that doesn't make sense. So everybody would be very I think, careful about doing that. I think that's a good point. That. I think that's yeah, one of the reasons why we took a, uh, took a kind of a frame approach because I look at AI as more of the weather coming. We like the forecasters. We're sitting in the sunshine right now getting the, the work done. We know it's coming. The question is, where will it land? Obviously security is one area, but like if you, if you connect forward day two operations saying, okay, assume there's some augmentation. This community knows automation. Mm -hmm. They like automation, no policy. Where would AI fit if it had to fit anywhere? Like what would it, like, what would you imagine that being if you had to kind of connect the dots? Assuming it rolls forward, everything's kind of going on. Where would AI help this community? Well, AI has played in a very important part in anomaly detection as part of the AI ops story, and that's yep. been a story for a number of years. Uh, so that's well established, right? That you can, if you have a large quantity of operational data, you can pick out the anomalies, and AI is very good at that. Machine learning in particular, yeah. you don't need generative AI for that. Uh, the generative AI story could, could easily help with, uh, you know, the overall context of uh, configuration in a, in a complex environment. So you could, you know, instead of having an engineer have to figure out, you know, what command lines to type over and over again, they could say, well, I want to set this up, you could say in English, just uh, expressing themselves, I want to set up this, uh, this environment to achieve these goals. You know, here, here's my data sovereignty goals, here's my security goals, here's my latency goals, and then hopefully the AI is smart enough to configure it properly. Or maybe it'll go off into left field and do something completely uh, well, so this is, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So building on your, You don't know, right? <laughs> well, so I, I kind of want to <laughs> dig in here a little bit, because building on your weather analogy, I mean, yeah, there's the forecast and we can see it coming, but we've had the NASA climate scientists on the show, and, <laughs> and I got to ask them quite literally, why is the weather so hard to predict? And, and the answer is the butterfly effect. Anything right. can happen, and yeah. I feel like we're very much in, and you know, I, I'm a little more nervous about some of this, I think, than some of my co-hosts, because <laughs> I understand the dark side and the bias pretty well. I, I'm wondering what sort of safeguards we're going to end up putting in place and the governance that's going to be necessary to make sure that nothing nefarious happens with this. I mean, it's a very much a wild, wild west stage. Yeah, it's hard. No one is an expert yet right now on what's going on. It's all too brand new. Have you seen anything, and this, could, this doesn't have to be AI-centric, have you seen anything at the show that really surprised you this year? Well, not, not specific to AI, but there are some other trends that uh, are new trends. Uh, so you talked about security, and one of the important security trends is the Software Bill of Materials, or SBOM, yeah. right, or just dealing with supply chain, supply chain security uh, in general. Uh, that's been a problem since the, the sonar type and, uh, or, and uh, uh, Log4J uh, breaches, uh, but now with the uh, federal, U.S. federal government mandating their cybersecurity program, that's coming up in June, and then uh, Europe is doing something similar, it's now urgent, right, that uh, the SBOM, especially for regulated industries. Uh, so there are vendors here that are focusing on that, and SBOM is slipping into a lot of the messages. So another key theme is uh, platform engineering. It's a very We've talked uh, about big, it a yeah, story. Yeah. Yeah. It's Rob's and, favorite topic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, a yeah. number of vendors are talking about that. And, and so it's interesting. On the one hand, you have the platform folks saying, well, you know, our platform is great for platform engineering. Use us or incorporate yeah. us into your platform. Uh, and then there are other vendors who are saying, wait a minute, we want to be on the golden path. And this is interesting. I hadn't seen this before. Right? The golden path is essentially 
uh, the established set of best practices that a platform engineering approach will not mandate, but recommend, right? You can always diverge from it, but it's going to be easiest to follow that golden path. So now all the vendors who have a piece of the story, whether it's CICD or the, the day two operations, are saying, you know, I want to be on the golden path so that any platform engineering uh, approach that you take will include us in that best practice uh, approach. Uh, and so that's interesting. So everybody wants to be, be you know, one of, one of the selected golden, golden children of the yes. platform engineering. Yeah, I, th I think that one is, is pretty interesting in that there are, to your exact point, there are so many different pieces. Right. And I think it also, just tying it back to, because I think AI will help in this space, mm -hmm. in the platform engineering space in particular, uh, especially with SRE work and some of the other stuff and tracing and observability, not to mention the security aspects of it. I think the one thing that I'm finding interesting from the people around is getting a big enough data set mm -hmm. of their own data so it, that becomes their IP. Because I think it, to the earlier problems with open, very large open models, I think it's how can you have your own data that gives you that? Have you been seeing uh, different companies really pushing in on collecting that data? Because it's a GDPR and everything else has some very gray areas in some of that data. Well, the, the story around telemetry data is, is maturing quickly, right? Open yeah. telemetry okay. yep. uh, is, you know, is yeah. an open source project that is uh, 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 you know, really ramping up very quickly. It's getting a lot of adoption and acceptance. And that now r relates to uh, uh, operational telemetry, so uh, logs and traces and events yep. and, and uh, metrics. Uh, but that's only part of the story, right? There are other kinds of data that fall outside of telemetry. And that's where it gets interesting, right? You could have, you can consider essentially all Kubernetes uh, metadata as being data that you could feed yeah. your AI. So all of the YAML files, all of the Helm charts, all of the manifests, uh, think of all of those as data. Now feed those into your generative AI and now you have essentially a large language model that will basically converse about how best to configure your environment. Right. Right. Maybe, or maybe it'll go yeah. off Or, or maybe field. even troubleshoot <laughs> it. And well, right. It has to be, it has to be known configuration. Yeah. It can't be like, do something for it's me It's got to be the know. fundamental Lego building blocks, right. not so well, much. I want, I want to ask you on the platform side, because you just brought that up, platform engineering. On the keynote this morning, the co-chair, Aparna, who was on with you yesterday, mm -hmm. she asked the question, um, how is Kubernetes doing with platform teams? There's a whole team discussion, what's the right makeup of a team, but the question was, is Kubernetes delivering on its promises, and where is it working, and where does it need improvement? What would you, how would you answer that? Um, well, uh, Kubernetes is becoming, I guess, part of the fabric of enterprise IT infrastructure, right? So, we're still talking about it as a thing, uh, but, over, but I think we're getting to the point where we're going to be taking it more for granted. The same way we, we take TCP IP for granted, or now we're taking Linux for granted. We just assume that it's there, yeah. and we can talk about it if we need to, and, and everybody here knows yeah. about Linux, right? It's an open source crowd. Uh, I think Kubernetes is sort of following that pattern. We're just going to assume it's in place, and when we talk to some of these uh, enterprise Kubernetes uh, end user companies, it's basically just part of how a modern approach for, for deploying and provisioning application capabilities generally. Right. Why would you use any other approach? Right. Right. Uh, now that it's still it's still part of the infrastructure, and you have to layer on a layer on a lot of it's other things. It's a layer things, cake, but right? you're absolutely but, right. But it's just but it's there's no reason not to use Kubernetes if you want to deploy enterprise software at scale. So, Ralph, I want to get your thoughts because I'm I'm looking at the Twitter feed right now. They actually have a graph, and they have simplicity, scalability extensibility, reliability, and portability. That's the rank of the who gets the, the, the most stars of like gold right. stars as, the, as a performance. Simplicity gets the lowest grades. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Decreasing complexity, and number one complaint. Scalability, it's got this. three stars. And extensibility, you know, five stars. And reliability, portability, five stars. So you can see kind of the trend patterns. The simplicity question is huge. Yeah. We're seeing a lot of managed services come out of Kubernetes. We've heard teams want to focus on other more critical DevOps or DevSecOps things and can someone else manage my Kubernetes for me? What do you guys see in terms of that simplicity piece? What, what, how does that get solved? Yeah, I think what's really interesting is that uh, portability also got five stars where I, I don't look at portability as being solved yet. And I think going between different flavors of Kubernetes is still incredibly hard. I experienced that most recently and <laughs> I, I can tell you it's So well, how many not stars easy. would you give it? I, I would probably, I'd probably give it two uh, on the portability part of it. Scalability and I don't, was it serviceability? I don't remember uh, what. Uh, reliability, extensibility, scalability, simplicity. Yeah, so 
simplicity, I think, is still, it's, when you're, I, I think it was said very well by one of our guests from Red Hat, the fact that we're still showing YAML files on a keynote is, <laughs> is ridiculous. I mean, if you want I, to, Can I just say amen to that? Yeah. This is one of those things where we very much agree in terms yeah, of if you, if you, we got to jump the shark here and like really get to a usable system where you don't have to write in YAML and upload it and then figure out what you, you t have a typo in there and stuff like that. I, I think that, to me, we still need to get there. I think there are some people on the floor who are bringing that. I think it's an evolution. We saw it with VMware, where everybody yeah. wanted to use the CLI for years and years, and oh, then, well, use Power CLI, and then it moved into vSphere and into the UI. And I think that's when the people aspect that they talked about in the yeah. keynote yesterday, more, you know, bigger tent type of discussions, people with different assets, you know, platform engineering becoming the new yeah. IT. Do you agree on that portability piece? What, what do you think about those grades? I mean, they're self-grading themselves, so everyone always thinks they're excellent. Yeah, uh, I think whoever came up with that list. <laughs> yeah, it's a little was, biased, maybe was, a little biased. Yeah, that. really wanted to make sure the illity was at the end of every word. And so, <laughs> and so they, they uh, eliminated they, uh, A little marketing uh, sprinkle there. Hyper. A few, a few other important Mega. things. For instance, uh, dynamic capabilities, I think that is a critically important part, right? So the way I see Kubernetes is it delivers two things very well. It delivers uh, scale and it delivers dynamic software capabilities, right? right? It, the ephemerality of the microservices enables organizations to deploy software uh, much more dynamically and enables software to behave more dynamically, right? Because of the auto scaling built into Kubernetes. So, uh, uh, and that's something that, that delivers a whole different set of capabilities for software, that it can scale up and scale down, and it enables uh, large organizations with multiple teams working in parallel to be able to deploy software uh, in, a, in a consistent yeah. way, without yeah. getting in each other's way. Now that requires a lot of moving parts, right? It requires a, a GitOps mentality, it requires the CICD be in place, right? All of these pieces have to fall into place. This is all part of the, the cloud native story, is that once you have all these pieces in place, then you get scalability and dynamic capabilities at scale. And I think so those are more important wants. than portability. Yeah. Portability is a piece of the story, right? Workload portability is a priority for some organizations, but, but I don't see that as being high on the list uh, compared to some of these other things. Well, one of the things I want to get your thoughts on before you go, because I know you got to get out, but this show I just saw on Twitter, the data backup and recovery is being discussed. Now, Rob, when you hear a show talking about data protection, it's mainstream. I mean, this is like a vendor show now. This is not just Kubernetes conference. Yeah. IBM's here, uh, Microsoft, Portworks. Intel, yeah. Portworks. Yeah. This, is a, this is a trade show. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, this is like an industry show. This is like a yeah. big deal. I mean, it is quite literally an industry show. I mean, this is not just KubeCon for developers and open source. No, it's yeah, become no. like VMworld almost. Well, it's a, it's a really big show, yeah. I mean, uh, well, it's, it, VMware is no longer a really big show. That last one, they, <laughs> they don't even call it VMworld anymore. It's called VMware know? Explorer, they downsized yeah. it. Yeah, they downsized it, but this one's being upsized. So, so this, this yeah. speaks to the trends of mainstream. So it's yeah. like, when I see stuff, we start to see some of the stuff we see at these right. shows, it moves out of like, nerd, developer, configuring, but yet YAML files are still on the keynote. Yeah. Oh, well, geez. Yeah. You know, Rob, just a quick question for you, because you mentioned it. You said the many different flavors of Kubernetes. What does Kubernetes taste like? <laughs> it, it's, <laughs> it's sweet, not sour. <laughs> I love it. Jason, last question for you. Okay. We do a very important segment here on theCUBE all about the swag on the show floor. Oh, yeah. uh -huh. Have you had, you've, you've seen all the booths, especially in the startup section, standing out, differentiating, very important when you're trying to attract attention of these enterprise right. customers that are here. Do you have a favorite piece of swag from the show? Well, personally, I don't collect swag anymore. My kids are grown, so there's no need for it. But <laughs> yeah. the one that stood out for me, they're, they're the, these Lego kits, Lego Star Wars kits. And I saw the, the R2-D2 one, and it's for ages 18 and up. So it's like, here's a Lego kit that is designed not you for children. You gotta be a voting you, you age You can't to be a child. <laughs> you have to be a voting age to, <laughs> Jesus. So what's Lego thinking? They're building stuff for adults that are only for adults? It's like, what's this world coming to? <laughs> it's nerd it's We nerd need to liber <laughs> liberate the Legos for the kids. Yeah. I was going to say, we can, we like can head to their headquarters. Here's an idea. Let's have really Legos for kids. <laughs> yeah. Wow, I think kids would like this stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm with you. Everything should be <laughs> for the kids, for everyone of every age. There's no need for ageism. Jason, thank you so much for joining us. You were the perfect start to the day. John, Rob, always a pleasure. You just offended, you just offended my, my inner child there with my <laughs> Lego. You know. You're 18 plus, you okay. can play with it. All right, we'll let you go nurse your wounds. Thank you all for tuning in to day three of KubeCon EU coverage here in Amsterdam. My name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for emerging tech news.